Hey, thanks very much, and for inviting me to uh, give you a, a quick um, extension of, of what Dana was talking about. Dana's report, and Dana and her colleagues' report is fantastic because it really sets the scene in terms of the, uh, particularly the benefits of uh, seaweed aquaculture. Um, I teach ecosystem services in the marine environment at the university, and this is the standard sort of chart you put up for shellfish farming, for example. And there's uh, key uh, ecological and social socio, uh, cultural and economic uh, benefits. And if we have a look at uh, which ones that um, different types of aquaculture fulfill, you'll see that uh, seaweed is uh, in every single category, unlike uh, fish farming or bivalve farming. It's the most benign uh, form of aquaculture pretty much that we have. Um, you've seen this figure already, but perhaps one thing that's, that was missed off this diagram or isn't very clear is this, this uh, detrital and dissolved matter. Unlike uh, land plants, uh, seaweeds grow from the base and they expect their ends of their, uh, their fronds to be lost uh, into the environment. And that uh, loss, as well as the uh, uh, material they just exude out their skin, a bit like sweat, um, is a really, really important source of carbon in, uh, in uh, coastal communities, especially in temperate waters where we have uh, large uh, kelp stands. And that's a major issue in New Zealand at the moment where we're seeing uh, large areas of natural kelp forests uh, disappearing uh, in some areas associated with trophic cats, cascades uh, from overfishing. But Kelp and uh, seaweed aquaculture has the potential to contribute to that enormous uh, uh, carbon in, uh, in our coastal ecosystems and increase uh, the productivity of our coastal ecosystems in, a, in an incredible way that other forms of aquaculture can't. And if you look at the studies around the world, especially those that have been done in temperate regions, the, the carbon coming from uh, seaweeds is really, really important in terms of driving coastal ecosystems. So around 30 to up to 60 or even 80% in some cases of the carbon that's found in uh, subsequent uh, trophic consumers, such as filter feeding shellfish, uh, detrital feeders, things like sea cucumbers, uh, um, worms on the seafloor, are um, uh, relying to a huge extent, 30 to 60 percent, on the carbon that's coming, being released uh, in various forms from, uh, from seaweed. So this uh, seaweeds have an important role, and so therefore uh, increasing that uh, carbon supply from, including from aquaculture, is, is something that's significant and worth having a look at. Um, I stayed up last, late last night after the aquaculture conference and I did this really gorgeous drawing. I was really proud of myself and I went to bed and I didn't save it, unfortunately. So at early this morning I had to get this horrible figure which is totally confusing, but the summary is there. That um, filter feeding shellfish and seaweed, you'd expect them to go together uh, very nicely. Because on one hand, shellfish, um, they uh, respire you know, they, they live and, and they uh, excrete, they, they produce um, uh, nutrients, uh, particularly uh, nitrogen forms of readily accessible nitrogen and phosphorus, and uh, or they also release carbon dioxide because they're, they're literally breathing organisms. And on the reverse side of that, uh, we've got seaweed and it loves all those same things. It wants uh, nutrients and nitrogen and phosphorus are in short supply in most uh, marine environments so, and seaweed needs it to grow. And it's, it's, uh, it produces oxygen as a result of photosynthesizing and that's just what muscles need to breathe. And another great thing about that process is it, it buffers the pH uh, and so it makes it more conducive to uh, shellfish uh, making, uh, calcifying their shells. So you'd expect it's a perfect marriage. Um, and uh, yeah, so you would expect that the opportunity for cold culturing uh, mussels with seaweed would be excellent because it's such a perfect uh, fit. So uh, New Zealand has an enormous opportunity. We have uh, 15,000 hectares or over 15,000 hectares of consented farm space for mussels in New Zealand and around 7,000 of that is already developed. So if we could culture uh, seaweeds with uh, our green shell mussel, we could have uh, two for the price of one, uh, benefit from the perfect marriage, as any of you who are married will know that benefiting from a perfect marriage is. <laughs> so I won't go there. Um, 
But it's interesting. There's been four or actually five studies done on this in New Zealand in one way or another over a number of years, and the results are quite mixed. Uh, so the first one was done uh, in 2008, and they, they basically looked at, they used food chain markers to have a look to see uh, whether green shell mussels were relying on carbon coming from nearby kelp. And they estimated, they also looked at Pacific oysters, and they estimated around 60% uh, of the, the carbon was coming from the adjacent kelp and 34% uh, 30, in oysters. So uh, that indicates that if you were growing them together, you'd expect to have some uh, mutual benefits. Um, uh, a second study uh, took um, uh, mussels and placed them in different uh, habitats with and without kelp or with kelp at different densities and left them there to feed uh, in that local environment and found uh, no difference at all between uh, places, mussels put in places with lots of kelp and places with very little kelp. So you'd have to wonder. So then someone thought they'd take it inside a lab and have a crack at it. And I hate to say uh, this experiment was actually done at my university and uh, it's been published. And when you take a close look at it, it's, uh, there's a fundamental flaw in it. I'm not going to point it out because it's embarrassing to me even. Uh, but I wasn't involved in it, <laughs> I have to say. But they claim it made no difference uh, in terms of the, uh, the growth of mussels with and without kelp in the same tanks. Recently, uh, we've just repeated that experiment and put in the appropriate controls to control for what wasn't perhaps controlled as well as it should have been previously. And we found the same thing. It's made very little difference to the growth of sublime mussels. And we don't know why. Uh, it, is, it is very confusing. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're, we're going to continue doing some work on it to try and crack it. But ultimately, the real test is for us to, be, um, to have some uh, mussels in place with some kelp or some seaweeds and grow them together and separately in the environment and see whether we've got any differences. We think, as uh, Dana alluded to uh, previously, it's, uh, we think these relationships are very context dependent on the environment in which uh, they occur. And it may be to do with the amount of uh, seaweed breakdown there is and the uh, microorganisms involved in, in breaking that uh, seaweed material down and making it more available. Seaweeds, some seaweeds anyway, have uh, anti-nutritional factors in them, things that try and stop uh, things like uh, fish, like butterfish, for example, coming and feeding on them. It interferes with their digestion. So there may be some uh, effect from that with some seaweeds in some, some situations, especially in how, whether they're exposed to predators or not. They may increase the amount of those, those, those chemicals. And there's also clearly some methodological issues. So that's one to sort out with the scientists. I thought I'd also, um, we've also been doing, doing some work um, with Goldridge Marine Farm and uh, uh, Lucas's crew and the Green Wave team um, looking at uh, the role of uh, co-culture in, um, in the relation to fish uh, recruitment. And so we were quite lucky Goldridge had a farm until it was harvested that had a lot of natural uh, kelp on it, a colonia and uh, undaria, and it was a mussel farm. And so we looked at uh, the numbers of fish and the types of fish recruiting into that farm, uh, which was a you know, very diverse farm uh, biologically in terms of that uh, uh, seaweed and, and, and mussels compared to a farm nearby that just had mussels, compared to uh, a sandy area and compared to a natural reef with kelp. And what we found really interestingly is that the, the, uh, the co-culture farm and the mussel farm had as good uh, fish recruitment as the nearby uh, uh, natural habitats. But in terms of operating as nursery habitats for those fish, and I mean, so those fish settled as larvae, but then the numbers that grew up to a larger size and stayed in that habitat was uh, higher in, uh, in the mussel farm and the co-culture farm than um, than, uh, than at least one of the natural habitats, and it was exactly the same level as in a natural uh, kelp reef habitat. So uh, it means that the co-culture situation, at least, and even mussel farms, are really important in terms of generating fish in coastal uh, communities. So I think um, we've struggled because we haven't had um, kelp farms to work on, but uh, Greenwave's solving that for us, and we'll soon be able to do that. 
but we can already see from these initial results that, uh, that uh, kelp farms or co-culture farms are going to be uh, important contributors into coastal ecosystems, even if it's just uh, increasing the production of fish. Thank you.